I was there by myself. My wife, nobody with me. I was just watching it. Just the, uh, the projectionist in me. So I uh, came on and it was, uh, I remember being there when all this stuff was being shot. So right. it was different sitting in the theater watching it and uh, it seemed to come alive being pieced together, you know, that way. I was overwhelmed by it, you know. And uh, I had learned to disassociate myself from the Antoine I was writing about and the older Antoine that I had become. Mm. But in the theater that day, I was the, the kid that I was. I was watching it and it was overwhelming for me. Hey guys, welcome to the Rebirth Podcast. I wanna thank you guys for watching and for listening. In this podcast, we talk to individuals that have had to reinvent, recreate, and reimagine in order to grow. But before you watch and listen, we wanna remind you to subscribe, to like, to review, and to share this episode and this podcast with everyone that you know. Thank you so much and enjoy. Mr. Antoine Fisher, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast. Hey, what's up, buddy? How you doing, man? It's, I'm great, I'm great. It's so cool, to, uh, you know, I, I know I know people, I've, I haven't said this about a lot of people um, that I've had on the show, but um, you were one of those individuals that when I decided to launch this podcast a year ago, I said to myself, I was like, okay, putting together like a wish list. And I remember putting your name down. And we've only met once. We're like, but, like we've only met once in person, one time in LA. And yeah. we met at a coffee shop, kind of typical LA story, right? You run into yeah. each other at a coffee <laughs> shop and you start introducing each other and talking to each other. But we connected and you gave me a number and I was like, all right, cool. But we never were able to link back up. And so I've just had you on my mind over the last few months, just wanted to reach out to you. And so I'm glad when I finally reached out, you were like, yo, what's up? And I was like, oh, he took my call. Like he answered oh, my dude. text. Like that's the way I felt for real. And then when we got uh, on the phone and we had, we caught up and had a conversation I, I, and I explained to you what I was doing and how I'd love to have a conversation with you about your life and what your, your work. Um, and you were just so, you know, welcoming to the opportunity for me to have you on the show. So thank you so much for making time. Well, you know, it's really uh, was a, a, a delight to meet you. I have to use the word delight because I was <laughs> delighted to meet you, man. And <laughs> I appreciate I, that. I remember when you were uh, on the dance show and yeah. I was watching you. I was thinking uh, I could never do that. You know, <laughs> I've always been like kind of shy. You know, the Navy kind of brought out, you know, that, this is a whole thing about me being shy, but uh I could never do that. And I just felt like you, you did it and you did it well. And because you were a veteran, I felt like we, we had like some connection. You know, I've met people who, you know, I remember uh, in Santa Monica, I met a guy who was in World War II. He was a really old guy and mm. he was just on the Santa Monica Pier. And we started talking and, I, and we found something to talk about. And it had to be related with the military we served mm -hmm. service together and we talked about different countries around the world that we had visited because he was in the Navy as well. And those countries never changed. They're still there. And, and just the idea that you can connect with a, a person who had been in the service, no matter what branch it was, you feel like they are not a relative, but somebody, a shipmate or somebody yeah. you have that, you know, or it's, it's okay to talk to him because I know where it comes from. Right, right. Now, now you, you mentioned the military. I mean, you spent, uh, is it 11 years? Is that right? Yes. 11 years in the United States Navy. You know, I don't know. I, I know you do a lot of speaking. Of, of course, you're a screenwriter and um, you've worked on a lot of projects and we'll get into, you know, the projects that you, you've been working on and what you're working on right now. Um, but, you know, the thing is that, you know, I know you do a lot of speaking as well. And I don't know about you, but for me, every time people ask me to come and speak and share my story, they always want me to begin at 19 years old. And I always tell people like, well, there's a whole life that, I mean, remember 19. So there was 19 years of life that took place yeah. that is important to touch on. And, and, and because I believe that a lot of that is what molded me and shaped me and prepared me and, you know, good, bad, and different, right? Like there's good and bad to everything. And so, um, you know, you know, I think that's one of the things is that 
I think for civilians, it's really hard sometimes to really understand the connection, the camaraderie that veterans have with each other. And because, like you said, it doesn't matter what branch, it doesn't matter exactly what your job was. We connect on this element of being a part of something that was bigger than all of us. And, you know, what we've all sacrificed and what we've all lost and maybe what we've all gained, like you said, there's a whole element to you in regards to like the military helped kind of give you out of this shyness, this shy element. And yeah. the military, I think, gave all of us something. It gave all of us something, right? Yeah. And, and 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 I think that's a beautiful thing is to be able to connect. But I do want to, I would like to rewind, if you don't mind, and just kind of go back to Antoine Fisher, like, you know, the early years before he joined the United States Navy and and, and it did 11 years. Um, and before we got get into you as a screenwriter and everything. I know you were born in Ohio, right? Yes, I was born in Ohio, yeah, Cleveland. And you, you know, you had a you had a challenging upbringing. I mean, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, I mean, from the get go, from the I mean, just from yeah. birth. Yeah. Well, you know, my mother was a foster child, and her mother had passed away when she was thirteen, and her father was deemed unreliable, and so. Uh, mm she went into foster care. She had older siblings, but, you know, they were off, they were older and off during their lives. And so she uh, got in trouble, whatever it was, she wound up in a girl's institution uh, and uh, she was pregnant. And so I was born there. And uh, then uh, they took me and put me in an orphanage in Cleveland. And she was supposed to come and claim me uh, when she got out, but she never came to claim me. And I went to couple foster homes and the last one was a really uh, abusive foster home and and when I was set, uh, 14 they removed me from there and they were trying to find a place for me and they told me they couldn't find a, a place that would take a teenage boy uh, like me I guess but uh, they found a um, a uh, it was a reform school in western Pennsylvania so they sent me to Pennsylvania and I stayed in this reform school till I was 17 when I graduated from high school. And I left there and made me an emancipated minor. I didn't even was I didn't even expect any of this. I didn't know what it, being emancipated was and uh what well, meant that I would have to take care of myself. And so they put me in a men's shelter in downtown Cleveland and uh it was too dangerous there and I wound up being on the street until uh uh, two days before Christmas that year, I saw the sign that said, join the Navy and see the world. So I went in and the recruiters were saying, hey, we're, we're going away for the holidays. Tomorrow's Christmas Eve. So uh, if you come back after the first, we'll try to help you out. But then I explained my whole story to them. And then they said, OK, we'll give you an aptitude test. And they gave me a test. I was so worried about it because I, I'm dyslexic. I didn't know it at the time, but I couldn't ever read like my uh classmates and so i took the test and i thought it was a miracle that i passed it and then they got you know because they knew i was on the street they got me a room at a holiday inn it was the first time i slept in a bed like maybe it felt like a year you know and i took you know this series of showers and then uh that morning a sailor came and said hey you ready to go took me to the federal building and that night i was in great lakes illinois in boot camp and I felt like this was a place that where I could just basically try to rest and, and try to figure out what I was going to do. And hopefully I could, uh, you know, be smart enough to stay in the Navy because I felt like sooner or later, because I had no self-esteem. Mm. I said, sooner or later, they're going to realize I'm not suitable for being in the Navy. But instead of that happening, you know, I, I began to fill up on self-esteem and confidence and over 11 years, of course, I traveled everywhere and made a lot of friends, learned how to socialize. I was, you know, I was diagnosed as being uh, dyslexic. They told me this was my issue and it made me want to read even more. So I started to read and I started liking words. And, you know, I had a very limited vocabulary and I didn't know you could use different words that kind of create a sentence and, and a style of speaking or uh, writing of your own. And mm -hmm. where I came from, generally, everybody spoke the same, used the same phrases and, and that kind of thing. I fell in love with words and, 
and I didn't know at that time that it would be my life's work at some point, but I stayed, got out of the Navy and went to the Federal Law Enforcement Academy in Glencoe, Georgia, became a federal corrections officer. And then after three years of that, I went to Sony Pictures. I ho- heard they were hiring security guards. I left my job because, you know, at the prison, you know, I was born in the prison. You know, I kept right. getting, thinking back where I started from, yeah. you know, where I started. You know, so I uh, started looking for my family while I was working at Sony. And uh, I found them. And uh, I didn't, I was only there a few months. So they told me I couldn't leave because if I left, then I wouldn't have a job when I came back. So I explained mm-hmm. my story again. And so they said, my boss said, go ahead and go and you'll have your job when you come back. While I was gone, they were telling, he had told other people and it was around the lot, my story. And some executives at Columbia Pictures and other places said, sound like you might have a, a story that might be good enough for a film. And I kept insisting on writing it. And they told me no, because I didn't have any writing experience, never went to college and uh, never went to film school. They said they would hire a screenwriter to write it and uh, they would pay me for my life rights. But I had learned in the Navy, there was a lot of things that I thought that I couldn't do previously and found out that I could do it, could learn how to do the different things. And people relied on me, you know, and I knew this about myself, I had learned mm-hmm. that. So I decided that I w- didn't have to ask anybody anyway because it was my story. So I got some legal pads and I start writing it by hand. I met this uh, guy who was teaching a, a free screenwriting class. And I told him my story. He said, my college roommate is a producer. I want you to go and talk to him and tell him your story. That college roommate turned out to be Todd Black. You know, he's a huge uh, producer now. Yeah. And um, we've been friends all that time. I guess we both were 33 when we met. (laughs) He was probably 32. I was 33. And uh, he said, uh, well, who else would write it but you? And then uh, he told me that he would uh, pay me to write my story and and said, you know, maybe I should leave that job as security. And he had an office for me on the 20th Century Fox lot. So I went there and over four months, he and his partners uh, taught me how to write a screenplay. I'm still learning how to write a screenplay, even though I've been doing it for 27 years. It's not an easy thing to do. But he called me one day and said, hey, uh, I sold your screenplay. And I'm dyslexic, right? So I picked up the check. I, I love this story, story, by the way. I love this story. <laughs> I picked up the check, and I thought it was $2,500. It was a little disappointing, but I said I didn't have any money. So I went to the bank to start me a checking account. But every stoplight, a stop sign I came to, I would take out the check, and I would I realized that it had too many zeros to be $2,000. So, it, so instead of two thousand five hundred dollars, it was actually two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and so you know it's almost like a person who's never had a steak, and he, right. you know you don't know whether to bite it or cut it or what to do. Just look at it. I don't know because I had never had nothing before. So, uh, so that was the beginning of my career, and you know I met my wife on the Sony Picture Studio lot. You know where I started working as a security guard. And, uh, you know, of course, I have two daughters, a 23-year-old and a 19-year-old. They're all here. And it's uh, everything, you know, I always wanted a family. And so I have a family. And, you know, you know, a lot of people care about me. But, you know, my wife and kids, uh, it's like, you know, they're really close to me. And, I, you know, it's a blessing, you know? Yeah, man. Oh, thank you for sharing. There's so much to unpack. I mean, from that that little summary you gave us uh, into your life, there's there's just so much to dive into, and I, I don't really necessarily understand or know where's the best place to start. Besides, uh, like almost at the beginning, you know, with you know being uh, in the foster care you know system, I, I heard you uh, doing a lecture once talk about you know how th- there's this a lot of this. Um, you know, publicity and movement around, you know, you have people that go to other countries to adopt and they go to those orphanage, if, orphanages and those shelters and they get kids from other parts of the world, uh, which is great. But then they're flying right over 
the shelters and the orphanages here in the United States when there are children just like you that have potential and just mm. need an opportunity and need a loving, caring you know, family. I mean, f- foster care, as you alluded to earlier, was 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 challenging for you. I mean, it, especially the second family that you were with. I heard, I read somewhere that you said that when someone asked you, interviewed you, and said, "Hey, tell us about that family," and you said, "Let's just say I I, I was being nice uh, in the film, and I was being nice in the book. They're actually worse than that." And, mm-hmm. um. You know, I, I know that that affected you. I know that that, you know, but what were some of the challenges? I mean, what are your feelings of, of, regarding the foster care system? I mean, to still as, as a 14 year old boy to say, there's nothing we can do for you. And so we're just going to kind of just toss you out and just kind of let you figure it out on your own. I mean, that, that's there's a lot of kids out there right now going through that. Well, yes. When they uh, sent me to the reform school, I wasn't the only kid there who was in that situation. Right. Uh, there was a few of us there who hadn't done anything wrong, but it was a place where we could be. And I uh, wrote a, about this in my book, Finding Fish, my memoir, that uh, I uh, one day, you know, a group of us were sitting around uh, complaining about the reform school where we were and, you know, pointing out things that we didn't like about it. And then I caught myself and realized, you know, I was uh, fortunate to be there. Uh, mm. They had parents and they had uh, options. and But, you know, I, once I thought about it, I had to stop. I told myself I have to stop doing this because uh, if I wasn't here, where would I be? Where I, the last place I was in that family setting wasn't good. So nobody's hurting me. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do every day. So I kind of adjusted to the uh, kind of institutional environment there, which probably made it easier for me to be in the Navy. I was, mm-hmm. you know, it's just pretty... Uh, like that rule-driven, structure. Yeah, rule-driven yeah. situation I was in. Um, I think that, you know, we really do need the foster care system because, unfortunately, a lot of people don't keep their responsibilities to their kids and, and, you know, you have to have some kind of uh, agency that can uh, monitor children and try to place them in places where they will be safe. Trouble is with that is that you can't see the minds and hearts of people. Mm-hmm. While I think the majority of people who are foster parents are good people, it only takes one person to cast a negative shadow on the whole thing. Right. Now, I had 13 social workers over the course of my time in foster care. And I really didn't get to know many of them, but the ones I did get to know seemed they really liked their job. They, what they liked about it, it seemed to me, even though it's a frustrating job to have, is that they can try to do something for uh, kids who probably, you know, like in my case, aren't, were in the world alone. Hmm. And so, uh, I, need, I still know a couple of them. Uh, my, I think one of my favorite fo- uh, social workers, uh, she came and she told me that she was getting married and so she wasn't going to be a foster. I mean, she wasn't going to be a, 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 a social worker anymore. Oh, it kind of really broke my heart because she was the only one that ever asked me questions. Like, mm. how's it going here? Uh, and if she would have kept asking, and I did tell her some things, uh, but I didn't reveal everything. And uh, But she was a probing kind of, and she was nice. She was young. She might have been like maybe 22 at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a kid, so everybody seemed to be a, an adult to me. Yeah, right. But, you know, you really do need uh, uh, people who are in the society who have space for a kid and uh, they care uh, that they could do something for someone who... I can't do any, anything for themselves in, in the way of taking care of themselves. I remember one time I was driving uh, somewhere in the city here and I came to a stop sign, stoplight, and I was waiting and there was a laundromat to my right. And I looked and I saw this sign on the w- window. It says, be a foster parent. And I thought to myself, you know, if people can't afford a washing machine and they are washing out. It doesn't mean that they don't have the love and and things like that, but they could aim a little higher and include 
people who have the means mm -hmm. to uh, bring in a child, you know, if they would uh, think to go to Russia or China, to Africa and, and other places to get kids and bring them in and raise them and send them to, you know, university, things like that. There could be an American kid who has the potential to provide the kind of love and affection that they might be looking for, right. you know. Uh, and there's another problem too, though. Uh, sometimes the actual parent of the child won't release the child. You know, they won't mm. uh, allow the child to be adopted. They always promise that they will come back for their kid. Mm -hmm. They're always in the process of working on their issues and they're eventually going to get their kid. And in the meantime, years go by and before you know it, the kid's 18 and, and, and just in this situation where they could have found a loving home when they were younger. You know, yeah. um, in my own personal journey, and I've talked about this a little bit in, in the sense of after I was injured, uh, I, I, you know, I had a challenging time transitioning from the military to the civilian world, as we refer to it as veterans. And um, and it was easy to pin it on my injury and, and the experience I had in combat and my scars and my new world, the new life that I was handed, it was easy to, 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 to just blame it on that and say, that's what it was. And it wasn't until my best friend one day, you know, um, when I was like, tw I was 24 years old and, and almost 25. And I was just, I was just mad and angry, and resentful. Um, I was drinking excessively. Uh, of course, nothing good comes from that. You know, when, when you're drinking, uh, the way that I was, and I was just numbing pain, numbing pain. But yet I would go out and in front of people and, and, and try to be an advocate for veterans. But yet when, when, when I wasn't doing that work and I was isolated, all of a sudden, all those demons surfaced, surfaced. And, and, and I remember my best friend telling me um, at 24 years old, he's 17 years older than me. So he's 41 at the time. And he said to me, he's like, man, you need to cry. He's like, what you're, what, you're, what you're dealing with is not only what happened to you in Iraq and combat, but there's stuff related to your childhood. There's stuff related to, you know, your relationship with your mother or your father not being in the picture. There was, you know, I was, I was um, subject to, you know, physical abuse and verbal abuse. You know, uh, my mother loves me dearly, but, I, you know, that's the way she treated me. And I never really thought about it because... Why would I? It was always easy for me just to focus on my injury. And it wasn't until that very moment that I started to realize and pay attention like, oh, oh, man, like, yeah, the injury is the, the, is the trigger to all of those emotions and feelings that I've just oppressed over, you know, my entire life up to that point. But once I dove into therapy, and a lot of it was with him, actually, whether he wanted to be my therapist or not, he was not by any means licensed, but he had his own experiences. But he became that person that helped me, that guided me, that helped me navigate through all of this. And then I went to therapy and I started to really unpack a lot of this stuff for you. You had, I mean, obviously in the film that was, you know, uh, based on your life, Antoine Fisher, where Denzel Washington was in it. And, and, and I remember watching that film for the first time because it came out in, is it 2003 when that film came out? 2002? It was two, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so this is, it came out right before I was injured, right? And I remember watching that film and, uh, you know, after I was injured and just feeling such a, uh, a deep connection to this relationship that you had developed in the Navy with a psychiatrist who um, was, from my understanding, at least from the film, and I would love to dive in a little bit more to understand, like, how... Was how, was that character everything that yeah, that in real life as as he was in the film, or was he more? Was he less? Was he a combination of of different people over the course of your life? I mean, who was that person? Because I know that when I saw that character Antoine Fisher in that film cry and and be vulnerable and let it out and finally be able to unpack and 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 just work through all of those feelings and emotions, I felt something, man. Like it 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 hit me and it just made me realize. Oh, okay. I, I, I can I identify with those feelings and those emotions. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, yes, he he was uh, 
someone, the, he's a lieutenant commander. He In the Army, he would have been a major. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, it seemed to me that he was a guy who went to school to be a doctor. And he probably wanted to do more for some of the kids that came through his office than he was allowed to do. And mm-hmm. I think probably, uh, I probably wasn't the only person he took a little extra time uh, that he probably really wasn't uh, allowed to do. But as a person who is a doctor and care about people, uh, he he went a, a little further than he was al- probably allowed to do. And I knew I wasn't the only one because every time I went to see him, there was always a bunch of people in the, in the waiting room waiting for him. He was one of the other doctors, you know. But the thing is, I think the Navy understands they're not recruiting 40-year-olds and and 39 year olds, you know, they're recruiting kids like kind of unfinished people. Right. Kids who have baggage from their childhood growing up and haven't had a chance to work through a lot of things uh, by the time they get to be 40 or in their mid 30s or 50s. So uh, they will try to reach out, but they won't give ongoing uh, psychological help. Um, you know, uh, what they will do is, you know, give you counseling and that kind of thing. And and with an actual doctor like he was, uh, you wouldn't get that much counseling from him. Right. Probably be some other people. And sometimes people who've lived life a little make better counselors than people who went to school and have a degree to do it and yeah. want to have a conversation with you about your feelings. And they never had feelings like that or haven't been in the job long enough to understand, uh, maybe on paper they understand, but everybody's different. And, you know, a new character can come into your office every hour, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and that's, I mean, it's kind of like the same, um, the same concept, like in the military, like you have people that, you know, come into the military as officers and then you have those that are enlisted. Right. And, you know, they, there's always this there's this little back and forth between those enlisted and those officers because the officers are like, well, I have a rank, right? Because of schooling and and and, and that, that I've been able to obtain. And yet those that are enlisted are like, wait a minute, man, like we do this job every single day. We know how this works and how that works. And you're trying to throw rank. You need to listen to us. And so it's kind of that element of like when you can have an officer that and your experience may have been different. But for me, what I have discovered is like, yes. Not all, not all officers are the same, of course, but if you can have that officer that was enlisted at one point in his or her career and then crossed over, I mean, uh, that was enlisted and then crossed over to become an officer, it's like, that's the perfect officer you want because it's to your point, they have some experience. They understand what it's like to be in this position. They understand what it's like to have leadership like in this way, shape or form. And, you know, that's what it sounds like, you know, as far as like, you know, the, the, this, this psychiatrist for you is like, he had yeah. some experience sure. potentially sure. to be able to like be patient yeah. and help you navigate, navigate through a lot of, a lot of Yeah. He was, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, patient. You know, he never really did anything. I thought he was going to like swing a watch in front of my face or like <laughs> hypnotize you. Say, tell me, you know, here, take these pills or something. All he did was get me eventually to start talking and he just listened to me. And he wasn't really asking me uh, many, a lot of questions. He did ask a lot of questions, but not one after another, like he, having a conversation, he just let me talk. And then uh, he would uh, pose a, a question. You ever think of this uh, and he would just offer me ideas and things to think about and then ask me what I thought about about it you know so it was almost like the therapy I got was kind of a therapy of self-discovery you know he was allowing me to come up with it, it on my own as I look back and didn't realize that what he what he was doing he was the one that allowed me to be angry. You know, you could be angry in his office. And he was like a commander, right? He was angry in his office. And you can't do that out in the lobby or back on the ship. You know, you get in a lot of trouble. But 
it, my anger, he, I think he just understood and expect that if you open up this can of worms, you might get, see him wiggling around. So, you know, you gotta, but he was very, you know, being the age I am now, I realized he was very like wise or maybe it was just all the kids he had come across. Maybe I wasn't the first Antoine Fisher he's seen, you know? Mm. How, how was it for you to have your life story be depicted in the film? I mean, I know you said you wrote the script and you had, you know, worked with these guys for four months to learn how to write and, and, and write a screenplay. And, you know, you did it. But then to finally see the story yeah. in the film um, that you know is going to be seen by millions of people around the world... Uh, were you emotionally ready for that? I had enough time. I wrote it in 93 and they didn't make it to uh, 2002. And because I wrote it myself and I knew everything that was going to be said and, and I was a part of, I was a part of it. I was on the set every day and, and, and the story meetings, I was just always a, a part of it. I think that if I had, just sold my story to the studios and then they made it and I went into the theater, it probably would have been like a horrible experience for me in that uh, the shock of it being right. revealed like that. But I was there when, uh, I wasn't there for when they shot the MLS station scene, but the day we shot, you know, when the camera pushes in on the window, the basement window, Mm -hmm. yeah. outside the house. I was there that day. I was staring by the, near the camera, not by the camera, but by the, uh, the monitors watching it. And, uh, you know, fortunately for me, I had, you know, Denzel and Todd Black and uh, the uh, director of photography, uh, Philippe Russolo, they and everybody involved in on the set were real sensitive to the story. And everybody seemed to feel that it was a story that was more important just for you know, the weekend film that would come out at the theaters, but it had some social value. And then, right. to, you know, these people, all of them that Denzel had assembled, him and Todd uh, were Oscar winner filmmakers, you know, you know, so they had all made plenty of movies before. But I think uh, to have an opportunity to uh, do something like this, I didn't realize that the movie would last as long as it has. Um, but it, it has, uh, just like uh, Dickens' uh, Oliver Twist had lasted, you know. Right. That, that kind of story where a kid is in a situation where, uh, you know, you know he can, you know, you know the story. So uh, some right. stories are timeless, and I'm not the only one. And I, every place I was, there were always other kids there. And uh, my foster siblings, you know, got it worse than I did. You know, I, I was uh, my brother. Uh, he got he had a tough time. You know, uh, but um, I I just think that uh, it was a, a kind of a beautiful way to, uh, you know, to surmise uh, to in summation, and not that my life is over, but the struggle to find a family and to have a family that was over because I, I did find them and I created a family of my own. I think that, um, you know, the cathartic journey of writing the story and uh, seeing it on the big screen and, and the reaction uh, that most people had uh, in, in that, they saw that it was a valuable film, not just entertainment, made me feel that it was worth doing it. And I had a lot of protection in Denzel and Peter Rice and uh, Fox Searchlight. They all uh, saw the film, I think, more than just the film. And uh, so, I, you know... It's something, you know, because I, when I first saw it, you know, of course I saw it being filmed and I, I never saw it put together because I thought that I should not be around when they're assembling the film. So yeah. I, uh, because I don't you know, want people to think that I was 
just going to stand around over their shoulders and watch and do all this, even though I was interested in learning about these things in general, but I felt like they need to have space. So Denzel had called me and told me that uh, they were going to show me the film and that I should go to the little theater on the 20th century Fox lot at a certain time and they were going to show it. I, I was there by myself. My wife, nobody went with me. I was just watching it, just the, uh, the projectionist and me. So I uh, it came on and it was uh, like, I remember being there when all this stuff was being shot. So right. it was different sitting in the theater watching it and uh, it seemed to come alive being pieced together, you know, that way. Uh, I was overwhelmed by it, you know. And uh, I had learned to disassociate myself from the Antoine that I was writing about and the older Antoine that I had become. Mm. But in the theater that day, I was the, the kid that I was. I was watching it. And it was overwhelming for me. And uh, I called Denzel afterwards and he said, so how, you know, how to do? I told him it was beautiful and I, you know, I can only thank Denzel, you know, uh, all the time. Uh, I would, I remember I uh, had given his a publicist a, a jacket that had navy on the back of it. And Denzel, Denzel said, well, I like gifts too. <laughs> I said, every time I try to think of something to give him, I, I just feel like it's not enough. And <laughs> saying thank you was felt, felt. It felt like that's all I could do, but I couldn't do it enough to make it as uh, as meaningful as I wanted it to be. Mm. You know what I'm yeah, so I felt like giving him a jacket was cheap. Yeah, you know, giving you know, saying thank you, uh, it, it it wasn't enough, but I so I had to keep saying it all the time. Mm. You know, Todd Black, same thing. You know. Uh, Still friends, you know, I see Todd, you know, you know, anytime I'll call him, you know, he and Denzel really taken off together making films, you know, like uh, Fences and uh, The Equalizer. And they are making a film right now in the uh, Magnificent Seven. They they just, you know, keep from Antoine Fisher. They cemented a relationship of being producing partners mm. and. And Denzel would direct the movies that he wanted to direct with Todd and himself being producers. Uh, and it started with Antoine Fisher. And, um, you know, I've been really fortunate all these years, even during my misfortune. You just had to mine out the fortune. Deciding to tell my story, I had to mine it out. And uh, I remember the first time I saw a woman uh, she was in the aisles of a Barnes and Nobles and she had my book in her hand. The first time I saw somebody with it, I was like, put that back. There's personal information in there. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting all offended. And then I dawned on me. I said, she doesn't know I'm Antoine. So I could walk right by her. And she didn't know. <laughs> oh, I love that. But that's, you know, that's hard. Like, how long do you feel like it took you to get to that place where you were, I mean, because you were still on this journey, right? Like, you, you got out of the Navy, you went and became a corrections officer in the federal, you know, prison system. You know, like you said earlier, you were back where it all started. You know, the irony in that. And then right before someone encouraged you to, to, to write and to tell your story and how this can actually be a film, you were on this quest to find your family. So you were still going, there were still a lot of like just open avenues as far as like in your heart, in your soul, in your mind that you were working through. Um, how, how, how was that process as far as, okay, so maybe seeing it on, on the big screen that one in the little theater was overwhelming, but then after that it was like, okay, it was fine because well, you had plenty of time. But in the early stages of writing it, I'm sure yeah. it, it took a toll on you. Oh, yeah, it was difficult. But what was driving me was that I felt like this was an opportunity to to change my life, to make it better, to to have a, a profession if I mm -hmm. was good enough for it. 
uh, and uh, that I would, you know, and I decided that I would work hard and when I got notes or whatever they wanted me to do, I do it. And, and when that was over, it appeared that several weeks had passed and there was no more notes or anything like that. Uh, all this energy I had built up to, to, to uh, achieve this, it was come up like a crash. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was I got a little down. Then I started thinking about some of the things I had talked about. And did I really want to say that? And did I really want to reveal that? And, and uh, so what helped me was when the movie finally came out and, and the, the reaction of the world uh, was positive. And it still took some time for me to get more accustomed to it. And I would start getting emails from people around the world. Some of it was in languages I couldn't understand, you know, and they had similar lives to mine. And they were happy I told my story because it was their story too. And they got a lot of uh, uh, satisfaction that people would see these stories and that and know that they exist. Uh, so, so the, and then, you know, my, my memoir was translated in other, like in Dutch, you know, Japanese and Spanish and French and other languages. And I thought that my story was worth, uh, some publisher felt like it was worth uh, taking my story and, and putting it out into their uh, society uh, as a, something of value whether mm-hmm. entertainment or something that could aid in this society. I started to feel that telling my story wasn't uh, just telling my story to gain a new career. I was learning that I uh, had did something that the world received very well and because of the honesty that I had when I was writing it. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you, know, you, you mentioned um, when that lady was holding Finding Fish in the bookstore and you're like, wait, put that back. That's personal information. But then thinking to yourself, you know, that that's a stranger. You know, that person doesn't know who I am. That person doesn't know that I am actually Antoine Fisher. But how did how now when you look at like your wife in the early stages of your relationship, I mean, now this is a person that knows that you're Antoine Fisher. I mean, how was that pro what was that process like as far as getting to a place of being vulnerable with her and sharing with her and not knowing how is she going to be able to receive that information? And is she going to stick around? Because your life for the most part, there was a lot of abandonment. A lot of people just kind of, you know, until you joined the Navy, then you found like, you felt like you found a home that mm-hmm. lasted longer than, you know, a few years. It lasted 11 years, but now to be vulnerable with somebody that is really close to you, that, yeah. that's a big step too. Yeah, well, I uh, I, I feel like uh, my reward for surviving was meeting my wife because she's a very nice person. <laughs> in in uh, uh, I feel that uh, well, that uh, uh. Part of my journey was over the struggle for fa- find, finding family and my place in the world, meeting my family and meeting my wife. Uh, I just felt like she was the right person for me, and I feel like she felt the same way. I, I, I met her on the Sony lot, on the same lot that where I was once a security guard, and she worked for a company that did a service for the studio. And so she would be there every Tuesday uh, for a meeting. And I, I met her one day and uh, we've been together ever since. I, I mean that I met her in like April and we got married in November. Of the same year? Of the same year. Oh man. And everybody was saying, you guys don't even know each other. But anyway, <laughs> we've been married. Like I've known her 25 years now. We've been married 24 years. <laughs> never had any problems, nothing at all, you know. So I feel like uh, um, from the time I was uh, born until uh, I met her was like one section of life, but I've been with her for 25 years now. Uh, so I'm 
almost matching the time that I spent alone. I'm almost mm. there. And, and uh, that time, the experience I had growing up uh, probably helped a lot of people along with myself. And, you know, now I remember the dread I would have after giving a speech or something like that or a talk. And, you know, you have to meet the people there. And so uh, then you have to, I always tell my wife, I have to go be Antoine Fisher. Mm. You know, you have to be, because people, they may have just read the book or seen the story for the first time. And for me, I lived it. Or for someone who had read it or saw the movie years ago, they may, when they see me, oh, you know, this is Antoine. But some people, when they approach me, they're crying. And they're not crying for me. Sometimes the movie or the book has opened their heart and they are dealing with their own feelings. So mm -hmm. I have to be sensitive toward people because I'm responsible for the way they feel, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's stressful, you know, for me. Uh, but this is what it is. And I remember, you know, I always, you know, you know, always call my wife afterwards and say, I did it again. Got through it, you know. And a big responsibility to uh, yeah. have open people that way. And they, they do hold you responsible for it, you know. Right. Why did you want to... Why did Why you want to find, find your, your family? family? Well, I wasn't actually looking for my whole family. I was curious about my father. Mm. I just had always been. And uh, when my social worker, when I was uh, taken from the home, I was 14, when she told me that my father's name was Edward Elkins and that he had passed away two months before I was born, he was murdered, actually. And... She said there was an article in a, in a Cleveland paper, you know, in Cleveland, uh, you know, like a lot of major cities, they have a black paper. And in mm -hmm. the 50s, the paper was in Cleveland, Ohio, was the call and post. This was the black paper. And so they carried the news of his death. Mm -hmm. And she said that there was an article in the, in the call, call and post. And... Uh, I researched and, and I, well, what I did was I called the call and post and asked them about the article. And they said they didn't keep those kinds of, those old articles anymore, but I might be able to find it at the Cleveland Public Library. So I called the Cleveland Public Library and they found it. And it was, it was on microfiche, they said. And they uh, sent me a copy, you know? Oh. And then I just got curious. Uh, I saw where the, funeral services were done and that company was still around. So I called them and they sent me his death certificate and I saw my grandfather's signature. And that made me more curious that, wow, I'm like, I'm finding out things one after another. So I thought I'd get an Ohio Bell telephone book. And, you know, I was a security guard, security guard at this time. So I didn't have a lot of money to be calling people. But, you know, when I grew up in Cleveland, it was pretty segregated. Black people lived on the east side. Whites lived on the west. Jewish people lived in Shaker Heights. And, you know, it was kind of like that. So it made it easier. I knew his last name was Elkins. I only had to look on the east side. Mm. And so I just, for some reason, decided to look in the area where I had grown up. It's called the Glenville area. And the first number I called turned out to be my father's sister. Wow. So... That's how I actually found them. I couldn't, in the movie, I, I find them while I'm in the Navy. I did that. I wrote it that way because if I got out of the Navy and wrote it as it actually happened, then Denzel and all the characters you met couldn't be in the movie anymore uh, because I had gotten out of the Navy. And, and then it would be more expensive because you had to hire a whole new cast for when I'm out of the Navy. Uh, so so I did it like that. But this is that's how I really found them. And I I called her and she said, Oh, who is this? And I said, Well, my name is Antoine. I'm looking for the family of Edward Elkins. She kept saying, Who is this? And, I, she, and she finally said, Well, I had a brother named Edward, but he's been gone a long time. And I told her, I think I might, I think I'm I might be his son. And then she said, Who is this again? And then I said, I explained everything. And she said, well, if Edward was your father, you have a big family. 
In fact, the deputy mayor of Los Angeles is your cousin. His name was William Elkins. He was Tom Bradley's uh, deputy mayor. He said, you should go and see him. And so I went and saw him. And he, and he said, uh, you know, you have a, you know, you know, they were welcoming to me. And they had an uncle down in San Diego. I had never seen anybody who looked like me before. And wow. uh, he was waiting out on the parkway for me to drive up. And I was like, wow. And then that Thanksgiving, they bought me a plane ticket to come to Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, they hadn't seen um, their brother since 59. He was only 23. And so uh, they were really uh, uh, excited. I mean, they had this big, you know, back then people could meet you at the jetway. So yeah. they had this big sign that says, welcome home, Antoine, you know. And the interesting is, thing is, is they lived in the same neighborhood I lived in when I was in the foster care. We used the same corner store. I went to elementary school with my cousins. One uncle lived two streets over from where I was in that horrible foster home. Wow. And never knew. Never knew. Wow. That's a, I mean, I, I'm listening to this and I, I got chills. I, I I can't even imagine you being. I mean, I, I, how is it for you? Because I, you know, I joke with my wife about this. Like, my wife comes from a big family. I mean, there's. I mean, she grew up, born and raised within like you know, two mile radius. You know, she's moved in three different homes, but literally with all the two mile radius. And when we started dating, and I remember going to the, for for the first time the holidays to like her family in New York, and and I was like, I was overwhelmed. I, because it growing up, it was just my mother and I, and you know people that made friends that she had made or whatever. But I stepped into her, into her family Thanksgiving, and it was on a whole. And then it was like, okay, we're gonna do hours here together with this group, and then we're gonna go to somewhere else and do hours with another group. And then I'm like, you're related to all these people, and, you know, and they're not, you know, some of them are blood, and some of them are just people that you've known for so long. They're like, that's my family too, right? And so, and, and it took me a while to adjust to that. I mean, how was it for you now being thrust into this big family and mm -hmm. discovering that you guys yeah, shared the same, the same space for so many years while you were suffering? Well, it was it was a, a, a lot to take in. You know, uh, when I was there, uh, of course, I found my father's family and they welcomed me. And, you know, they came from all over the country to to meet me there in Cleveland. And uh, I was, uh, uh, one morning, uh, some, come, some of them came into the room where I was sleeping and said, hey, uh, your uncle, uh, Uncle Spy, his name was Spinoza. His, uncle Spy said that he think he might've found your mother and he wants you to put your clothes on. He's coming by to pick you up. And I said, oh, wow, you know, it was already, a lot for me. I wasn't this isn't even, the same trip. Yes. Oh. I wasn't even looking for uh, my mother. And uh, so uh, when he came, he said, you know, we were driving. He said, I have a friend named Jesse Fisher. And uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, uh, a lot of people who live in a certain area here in Cleveland don't ever move too far from where. And I asked him, uh, I told him about you. And I told him, you told me that your mother's name was Eva. Fisher. And he said, Jesse told me he has a sister named Eva Fisher. And so he told uh, him to bring him, bring me to his house. So I went there and then they, he said, okay, let's uh, go and uh, over to see Eva. So he took me over there. Now, when I was a homeless that winter, I used to go into these housing projects called the Longwood Housing Projects, and they they had rooms that were warm, like where you could, you know, where, the, where they keep the, um, like, brooms and things like that. And I would stay in there <clears throat> to be warm. And this was the housing project where my mother actually lived during the time I was homeless. And so when they took me uh, over there, I recognized right away and so we went into her apartment, her apartment, and she was there at the stove. And I didn't think that could possibly be my mother because she looked too old to be, you know, I wouldn't imagine her being. 
But, you know, and, it, you know, as a kid, you know, you always think in the best, you know, like my mom looks like Diane Carroll or somebody like that. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> but I could look at her when they told, well, her brother, my uncle said, pointed at me and asked her, who is he? Who's that? And she said, oh, that's Johnny, right? And she, he said, no, that's Antoine Fisher. And then she like fell out. You know, she had never seen me before. So I thought to myself, you know, I didn't feel like she owed me anything. Mm-hmm. It was just like I was seeing somebody that I just happened to be seeing. And but I, when I realized, when I accepted that was my mother, I could see that she probably didn't make a lot of good choices in her life. And you know, you can't really judge. You know, I felt because I understood how my life had went. Every day there was a new choice that could send you spinning out of control. Yeah. Everybody's not able to to manage uh, being in a world, you know, the way it is. And I thought that about her. And so I, I just felt like, you know, compassion. You know, I was, you know, 33 years old. I was tall, you know, I was dressed really well. You know, I had this nice little uh, stint in the military and I was federal officer, you know, for a while. And, you know, there's no reason for me to come down on a stranger uh, because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, she didn't owe me anything. I didn't feel that. Uh, so uh, um, eventually uh, my uncle, her brother said, uh, maybe we should go give her a chance to get herself together. So that's how I met her. And But all of this, came crashing down on me when I got on the airplane headed back to L.A. Couldn't control the tears, man. Because I I had learned how to put up a, you know, my whole life I had learned how to put up a a fence, a a shield. And one of my aunts rode with me. She was, I was going to change planes in Chicago and she was from Chicago. I met her in Chicago and went on to Cleveland in the same way going back. She was sitting next to me and I was looking out the window. She was sitting by the window and I was just thinking like all of that, not just me coming home, uh, meeting my family, but all of that I remember from the time I was, you know, my first memory I talk about in my memoir is I see myself sitting on the chest of drawers at the window and, you know, the garbage men in those days would have a big truck and they would go down the street and and the men would hang on the side of the garbage truck and they would jump off and get the cans and toss. I used to love to watch that. I wanted to be a garbage man when I grew up because they seemed so strong, you know, and I would watch them and just when it looked like they're not going to, get the garbage can out of the truck and it's going to get swallowed up by the truck, they would grab it and take it out. You know, I I couldn't wait to garbage day so I could see that, you know. (laughs) So that's the first memories I have. Wow. That is, that is a lot to take in. What I'm curious about is why were you initially on this quest to find your father and not your mother? I just, I don't know. I just always thought about him. You know, what's strange is that even when I was a little boy, I would think about him. And I would have dreams. I, 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 I'll tell you the truth, that I would have to find him in the graveyard. Yeah. And I would. And I don't know if it, there was a show back then called Dark Shadows. Right. And it was kind of a, like a soap opera that came on in the afternoon, right when you got home from school. And they had vampires and werewolves and things like that so, uh, in my in my mind you know maybe that's why I thought that but I had seen other shows it could have been other but I always felt that you know that I would see him you know that's where I would meet him and I would have the dreams I would have recurring dreams like the dream that opens the film that was a dream that I would have a lot as a kid and wow. so I just always thought about him you know, as a boy. Wow. Wow. Have you, did you ever, did you maintain a relationship uh, with your mother or anybody on that side of the family that you met on that trip? Well, well, yes. Well, uh, my mother, we spoke on the phone a few times, but, you know, we didn't really have much in common. You know, Uh, 
you know, I think when people have a mother, they think, oh, it's your mother. How could you not have anything in common with her? But if your mother has never been around you, you don't have yeah. any history. And all it is is someone saying, oh, this is your mother. And you don't have any magnetic field. There's no magnetism that comes to this person because she gave birth to you. The reason right. why, you know, people uh, as a parent and child develop a relationship from the time they're born, they're together all the time. Uh, I have a more of a familial relationship with my teacher that I had for the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade who knew me better than my foster parents did, you know, mm -hmm. I felt. And, uh, but my mother, she was uh, cool and I was a square, you know, I never did <laughs> drugs and she had, you know, obviously had done things. She was uh, really honest. Like if you ask her a question, you have to be careful because uh, I tell you, like, for example, I asked her, I said, why didn't you ever come uh, for me. She said, to tell you the truth, Q, she called me Q because my middle name is Quentin. Uh, said, to, to tell you the truth, Q, I just didn't want you. So, ah, uh, but, but I asked and, and that was her honest feeling. She was more honest than a lot of people that I had met in life. She, she told me, she said, ain't no shame in my game. The, 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 the I just didn't want you, is what she said. And I got offended first, but then I thought to myself, uh, this is a person, I, I learned this, this is a person, if you ask her something, she'll tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And so some people will ask a question, but they want a soft answer. It yeah. was, uh, it was, you know, the idea that she didn't want me, well, I didn't know her anyway, but the idea that she just didn't want me, well, it was kind of thorny way of saying it. <laughs> what can I say? Thorny, I like that. I like that description. You know, I had a sim I had a similar experience. So my father left when I was nine months old, and I found him um uh 2019. Um, I, I connected with him and I, I went to where he is and where he lives and he lives in Mexico and, uh, he lives in, he pretty much sleeps on someone's patio. He's homeless. He just kind of bounces around. Uh, his clothes are beat up, you know, doesn't have, doesn't have anything. And, you know, here I am now seeing him for the very first time. And I, of course, ask him a lot of questions, but then I asked them that same question that you asked your mother. You know, hey, why did you leave us? Why did you leave mom and I? And he he just straight out just said, I just forgot about you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you and, can and that was and, and again, like I was like, Man, I didn't say that then, but now when I when I tell that story, I'm gonna tell people like that was a bit thorny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, but you get, you know, I guess a lot of people who've been through a lot, they don't feel there's a reason to sugarcoat a lot of things. Yeah. Well, you know, the, as far as the other part of my uh, mother's family, uh, or my family on my mother's side, uh, the uncle Jess that took me to her house, uh, we remained close friends till the day he died. And he was really welcomed me into the family. You know, he was, cons you know, I was never, uh, had a family like that. So he would always call me and I would say, he not call me, make sure you call me. He was treating me like I was one of his children. Mm -hmm. Like he needed to know how I was doing. And I started to get accustomed to belonging to a family because of him in that way. Mm -hmm. When I met my father's family, they were all an older family. And a lot of them didn't have, you know, they have a lot of kids. So within the 10 years, um, after I met them, they were all gone. So I was lucky to meet them when I did. So I did get the chance to meet them and, and know them as well as I could uh, uh, when I first met them. And then, um, you know, they're all gone now. But uh, And then Jess, he, he's gone. And my mother is gone. My mother uh, passed away in 2010. And they told me, uh, called me and said, you know, are you coming out here for her funeral? I said, well, I'm not going to come out, but I can't 
but I wrote something for them, someone to read at her funeral. And they said they were handling everything. So a week went by and a cousin called me and said, uh, Antoine, why are you doing this? I said, doing what? He said, uh, you know, your mother's still at the funeral home. I said, I thought you guys had everything covered. They said, we do, but you have to, you're her next of kin. You have to sign for us to be able to do what we, we want to do. I had never been anybody's next to kin before. I didn't know I had a responsibility to her. You know, even though she didn't raise me, I didn't really know her. But since I had come forward and every and, and, and identified myself and she identified me as her son, uh, I didn't know that. Wow. I didn't know that. So I did everything I needed to do. They were going to cremate her. So the funeral home contacted me and I had to fax them this signature, uh, this document. And they said they would call me back when it was done. And they called me. And the whole time I started feeling like, wow, you know, I, I, uh, I was happy, happy to do it and happy for her because she had a, such a tough life. And I felt that I did something for her that nobody else could do. So I felt like a kind of pride that a son would have when he, you know, doing something for the parent, you know. Did she have any other kids? Yes, yeah, she did. I haven't met all of them. I'm, I was her first kid and I met uh, two of them and uh, never really was close with, with, with them. But uh, one of them I liked, uh, but I was closer to my father's family. Even now, uh, you know, I could just get on the phone and talk for an hour or so with a cousin in Chicago and my Jess's daughter, which is my cousin, first cousin. You know, they're all first cousin. So, yeah, I kind of slowly became comfortable with having a family. And, you know, meeting my wife was different. But, uh, yeah, I feel like I found my place in the world. Do you, how do you feel like that experience, not only knowing your own childhood and, and the struggles you experienced, but then meeting your mother and your father's family? And, uh, how do you feel like that has shaped you as a, not only a husband, but as a father to your two kids? Well, I don't know if meeting them had, uh, had an effect on me uh, in the way of how I interact with my family mm -hmm. that I created. But I think being in the Navy did. Uh, you know, what I discovered about people and families, you know, I have a lot of friends and, you know, you see these families and uh, a lot of families don't have any leadership, really. You know, I think sometimes people think, well, he's the father, he's the leader, or she, he's the uncle, he's the leader. But, you know, sometimes it, it could be the grandmother or the, the mom who's really got the leadership qualities. And I think since, you know, when you have a family, there's always hard choices to make, hard phone calls to make. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to, be stern sometimes you have to be soft and you have to be understanding you have to do all that i think while i was in the service i did learn a lot of lessons about dealing with people you know once you go up in rank and you have a bunch of people who work for you you have to, and i think um i'm gonna tell you this story i um I had been on a ship called the USS Schenectady, my first ship. It was a LST 1185. So after that, I got transferred to Pearl Harbor, and I was on a ship, a destroyer called uh, Richard S. Edwards. And I heard that my ship was coming in to Pearl Harbor, my old ship, and this was going to be an opportunity to see some of my old friends. So I left the ship. I went AWOL, actually. Nobody knew I was off the ship. A lot of people think, you know, who haven't been in the military think that if you go AWOL, it means that you went home or you went to right. home. You could just leave the ship and you'd be AWOL. So I left one pier and went to another pier. And as the ship was pulling in, I saw my friends and they came down on the pier eventually. But, you know, I was E5 at the time. Nobody was searching for me, really. 
so I was, uh, you know, have reunion with my friends. And when I came back to the ship, my boss was on the quarter deck standing watch. You know, he was, that was where he was supposed to be for the next, for the four hours he was standing watch. And I came up on the ship and I saw him. He looked at me and he said, hey, Fisher, didn't say anything. And then I said, oh, man, I'm no one in trouble. Now he'll put me on report. So I went to my workspace and start working. I would make sure everything is done. When he got off, I was still down there hustling, trying to make everything right. Yeah. At least I could say, well, I got everything done. But that wasn't the point. He came down. He he said uh, he was looking around, checking things out. And he said, where'd you go this morning? I said, uh. I, my ship, old ship pulled in. I wanted to see some of my friends. And he, she said, oh. And he walked out to the, toward the door and he turned around. He said, you should have asked. Now, he could have put me on report, right? And I had mm-hmm. to go see the captain. Could be able to put on restriction, take money from me and all that. You know, in the military, you can't go to UA. You can't do it. Yeah. They come down on you like you murdered somebody, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I never forgot about that. So, you know, you have kids and you think just because they make a mistake or they make their own choice, you don't have to hammer them. Mm. You don't have to do that. If you, you know your kid, you know that, you know, most kids, if you know, love the parents, they don't want to disappoint them. And, you know, it's not like, you know, I wasn't trying to be a good sailor, you know, which I was, you know, and that was like a flaw right there. And I remember when I first made E3, E3, E4, um, which would mean like a corporal, uh, I had never had that many people working for me. So I started cursing them out and yelling at them and stuff like that. <laughs> and so they stopped working. I, every time I go around, they wouldn't be doing nothing. I'm like, so I went and told my uh, boss, I said, they stopped working. And he turned around and said, that's because you're an asshole. <laughs> I mean, he was a senior chief. He was an E9. So <laughs> I said, you know, and I was telling him, he said, hey, you know, you, you, you know, always, you know, yelling at him. You, know, you don't, you don't get down there and, and, and show him what you know. You don't work with him. You don't do this. <laughs> you, all you do is stand around, walk around, you know, with your, you know, you know, <laughs> telling him that you were corporal. I mean, that you were <laughs> third class petty officer. <laughs> That's because you're an asshole. <laughs> I, you know, it's like an E9 tell you tell you that. You start thinking, am I in trouble? <laughs> you're right. <laughs> and then he, he said, you need to. And I was so disappointed in myself. And I was so mad at him for not backing me up and the whole thing. And it was some things I needed to learn. I realized after I, he spoke to me. But I was mad at him for his reaction. And I remember we were passing each other on the. On the, in a hallway, they call passageways like this. And as I was approaching him, he said, hey, Fisher. I said, how you doing, senior chief? He said, don't let that shit bother you. <laughs> Talk about what he said. So these these kind of these kind of experiences in the in the Navy, even though you know we don't use that kind of language in the civilian war and stuff like that, but you know, things like that over a course of eleven years. You learn, you know, you learn this, you learn that. And when you get out, you recognize a family that doesn't have real leadership. You got to know what you're good at. If I'm not good with the finances and my wife is, just because I'm a guy doesn't mean I'm the one that's supposed to be doing that. Uh If if I'm good at making the hard calls and doing this, that, or my older daughter is volunteering to do this, you know, you got to let the family be a family and be real. You can't just, you know, I'm a man, so, you know, I got to be the man. I'm a, you know, it's another thing I learned in the Navy. Uh, you don't want to be the boss because the boss got to take it on yeah. everything. So when it, when it, when the hammer drops, yeah, it's good. You know, you got to, you know, if you want to be the boss, you got to take the heat, man. Yeah. So, so we do it all together. We'll be together. I think some families, uh, you know, uh, you know, when you talk about a family, it's not just my family. If you have cousins and uncles and stuff, they really should work it like a 
like a company, there should be someone who's willing to gather books for the young people who are in the family, whether they're in Oklahoma, or Florida, or in Ohio. If there's books that you can distribute around, these are books mm-hmm. people to read. They need a master at arms, that crazy uncle from Chicago, who, who they give him a plane ticket to go to Mississippi to talk to this one kid in the family. You know, <laughs> you know, you you need to, you, you know, because I think families are in competition with one another. These cousins is is don't like you because you have this, and you know, you know, some parents think. When their kids become successful, they're supposed to get half of whatever they make. You know, mm-hmm. it's just all of that kind of stuff. People have to be real about about leadership. You want to be a leader? You got to be mature to be a leader. You got to be able to take a smack if you want to be a leader. Yeah, for so sure. If you ain't willing to take a smack. Don't be volunteering to be a leader. Don't take the role. Yeah. Don't take the role. Uh, uh, you know, we, we see now, um, we see veterans now getting into, you know, the entertainment space, whether they're writers or they're actors or they're behind the scenes. Um, you know, how, how does it feel, you know, for you as someone who has been in this industry for as long as you have been working to now see other veterans now have the opportunity to tell their stories or find a little bit of their identity or purpose in this space? Yeah, I think. Uh, veterans, people who've been in the military, such as yourself and me, uh, we have uh, uh, experiences that most civilians never have. Mm-hmm. Even the kind of experiences that I just spoke about, about leadership. Uh, some people have never, you know, maybe been the manager at McDonald's or something like this. Nothing wrong with that. But nobody's ever had real pressure on them. They may have felt pressure, but it's nothing like somebody's shooting at you or you're in an area where people are shooting or you're simply on a ship that's made of steel and it's electricity running all through it and you're sitting on the Pacific Ocean. That's a lot of pressure. (laughs) (laughs) So I think a lot of people, uh, they, you know, they may go to college, get out of high school and they, going to their, to, their, to their jobs, but they don't have the, they may not have that great adventure, you know, you know uh-huh. have many great adventures, you know, they take you around the world and every time you set foot on another continent, no matter how many times, there's all a new adventure. Some people have never seen what it looks like at night in the center of the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic or the, uh-huh. the Indian Ocean. Some people think there's seven seas, I know there's more than seven seas. You know, mm-hmm. it's just uh, something that you know and what you become. And uh, that's a lot to offer an industry that's trying to come up with stories, adventures for people to look at. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Man, I've, I've enjoyed, enjoyed talking to you so much. And I feel that we could talk for hours. I really do. I feel like I'm one of those first cousins that you can hop on the phone with in Chicago. You, cousin, you know, I'm assembling my family, man. You know, <laughs> that's the one thing I realized when I was a kid, when some people were stuck with people and I realized, well, I don't have, you know, this, I don't have that. So I started choosing people. Mm-hmm. You know, the people you meet in life sometimes make better family members than people you're born in a family with. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. You know, so you can't, um, you know, we're only going to be here for a little while anyway. If you meet good people and they, you know, you can add something to their life or their children's lives and they can add to you and your family and the way of being a human and uh, just uh, why not, you know? Yeah. Well, Mr. Antoine Fisher, I appreciate you sharing the story that you were I guess, born into, and then sharing the story that you started to create for yourself once you joined the Navy um, and what you've been doing with your wife and your daughters and other people in your life as well. And I just appreciate your willingness to be vulnerable with me on my podcast just to talk about this journey because I know 
there's a lot of elements and I always encourage listeners to listen to every story. And even if it's not exactly to the T of what your experience has been, there's a lot you can learn and take away from someone else's experience. And I, I know that there's going to be a lot of people that, that are going to take a lot away from your story and, 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 and what your world has been about. And so I just appreciate your time. And, and, uh, and, and I, and I knew this was going to be a great conversation, especially when we got on the phone, just to kind of talk about get you know, doing the podcast and, I think we talked for like an hour and a half, just, you know, just you and I just shooting the shit just for an hour and a half. Just and and yet we've only met once in person for a few for a few minutes. It wasn't even for a few hours or a few minutes yeah, at a coffee I, shop. I was passing by your chair, but walking uh, either from the restroom and I walked past the chair. You were sitting with a group of people. I said, I don't I, know what I was doing. I said, that's but, that dancing brother. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking for you to see if you had on your dancing shoes, man. Yeah, no, man. Those are retired. Those are retired. <laughs> I, I've retired those things. I, I tell people now, like, people used to come up to me and be like, oh, show us your moves. And they would expect me to bust out in a tango and a, like in a pasta doble. Like, I'm just going to start doing this, you right. know. And uh, and I'm like, no, like, now when I go to the party, I'm doing like the running man. I'm doing like, you know, the shopping cart. <laughs> <laughs> cabbage patch like that's what i'm doing now like i just all the all that three months of work that i did and everything poor karina taught me is just gone i've gone back to my roots now so that is the extent of my dancing man but it, it's it's a pleasure to call you a friend it really is sir thank you again for your time and your energy I, I, you know just it, it really is a pleasure and um and just loved hearing everything about your life and i think we'll have to i'll have to reach out to you at some point and maybe we can you know, kind of wrap again on something else. Yeah, yeah. You know, I really appreciate uh, you uh, uh, contacting me uh, again. And, and, you know, I thought about you, you know, often, you know, over, over the time since the last I saw you. But, uh, uh, and I kept your number. I was, yeah. You know, so uh, I'm glad we finally connected again, man. You're good. Yeah. Man. Well, I have this thing, too. I have this element of the, something I got to learn to work through that, I've met a lot of people, right? Like including yourself and I have your number, but I've never felt like I, I reach out to people because I don't want people to feel like I'm reaching out for this, you know, like I don't. And so I, I, my best friend's like, dude, like what people give you their information, reach out to them. And, and I think there's a part of me that is like, well, there's that fear of that rejection. Yeah. That still exists, exists in me. Like if I text him or her, are they going to be too busy to respond? Are they even going to have my number? Are they going to say, who's this? Which is the, like, for me, is like one of the biggest fears that I have for someone to respond. I'm like, who's this? And I'm like, damn it. You know, like, and, and <laughs> damn it. Like, oh, this, shit, it, it happened. Who said Martinez who? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's this area code, from, area code from? And so, like, when you respond and you were like, hey, what's up? I was like, oh, he has my number. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. And, uh, yeah. It put a big smile on my face as I as I have one on my face right now. So stay in touch, man. We definitely will, brother. And uh, you keep writing, you keep creating films and stories that all of us are going to love and be inspired by. Um, and I know that there's a lot of incredible work that you're still going to be, you know, putting out to the world. So I just appreciate your art and appreciate your storytelling. And uh, we'll do it again. Okay, brother. All right. Take care. All right. Peace. I don't know about you, but I enjoyed listening to Antoine. His tone, his pace, I mean, everything about the way that he speaks and he tells his story is so calming and relaxing and it just pulls you in. I can't thank him enough for his willingness to come on and once again, you know, just dig up a lot of those old memories and those thoughts and those feelings and his willingness to be vulnerable with me, with us. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please be sure to share and subscribe. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at I am JR Martinez to learn more about these amazing guests and me. Until next time, this is Rebirth.